intended my next video to be a should you read Lord of the Rings video and I'm still gonna do that uh, hopefully next but I got a comment on one of my Rings of Power videos and it kind of derailed my plans it kind of sent me down a rabbit hole spiraling and here we are with a video so the comment in question was on I think it was on my last Rings of Power video if not the last one then the one directly before it I think it was on the last one because I made a remark in that video about how orcs were corrupted elves. That's like, that's where they come from. That's what orcs are. And I got a well-deserved correction in this comment. Only the original orcs were elves once. Morgoth, who was long gone, did that to them and created orcs. That happened thousands of years ago. No one's going around turning elves into orcs anymore. Orcs are just orcs now and beget orcs. All the orcs we see in this time period were born or spawned as orcs. And when the, I read that comment, I was like, actually, yeah, okay, that does sound right. First things first, I kind of want to set the scene for me and Tolkien because I'm guessing that uh, a not insignificant number of people watching this video only have seen from me the Rings of Power videos, which would not tell you really anything about what I know about Tolkien, like for real. Because <laughs> I'm just making fun of the show being bad and mostly just talking about the show being bad just for itself, irrespective of lore or canon or anything like that. So to kind of again set the scene for like me and Tolkien, what, what I know, what I've seen, what I like, blah, 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 blah. Let's just do that really quick. So what I've read of Tolkien is I've read the, the trilogy, Lord of the Rings trilogy. Uh, I've read The Silmarillion. I've read part of The Hobbit and a long, long time ago. Like my dad was reading it to me when I was a kid, but we never finished. And I've never, I, I've been meaning to read it as an adult. I just haven't. But I fully read the trilogy and I've read The Silmarillion. In terms of like what I know about Tolkien lore, Tolkien canon, etc, etc. The Peter Jackson films, the extended editions of them, I have seen more times than any human should. I have basically memorized them. Um, and I'm not saying that's canon, but like, you know, that's a lot of information about Lord of the Rings is coming from there. I generally know how the films do differ from the books, like the, the big things. I don't know every single thing that's different, but both because I observed the differences and because I've seen videos and I've read articles about differences over the years, then I have a decent understanding of what things Peter Jackson changed. And oftentimes I have a decent amount of knowledge as to why he made those changes, like be it because um, he just completely decided to not do what, what Tolkien had or because it was something that like Tolkien had kind of like been uncertain about and so Peter Jackson kind of had to pick one. So like I kind of have an understanding of that. Um, I have bits of lore that I know either because they just like really stuck with me or because I just found them particularly interesting so then like I looked into it more or remembered it better but I don't like have a encyclopedic knowledge of Tolkien lore by no means. And I know a decent amount about Tolkien the man. Um, again, not an expert, would not position myself as one, but like I know, you know, that he was a professor, I know he was a Catholic, I know that kind of he it was like world and language first, story later, I know he was friends with C.S. Lewis, I know that he hated allegory, I know that he hated Dune, <laughs> I know that he had experiences with war and like that may or may not have colored how he depicted things in these stories. He himself says, no, not really. Most people say yes, probably. <laughs> so like, I, I know something about the man as well. And then I want to make my position on lore more clear, because again, I don't talk about this in the Rings of Power videos. Um, and part of why my Rings of Power videos are not about lore, um, again, one, I'm not an expert on it. There's better people who can tell you what when it's breaking canon than I can. But two, I don't totally care about that. Um, I care about good storytelling and so when something's breaking lore, more often than not, that results in bad storytelling, but not definitely. My first priority is telling a good story or my first priority is enjoying a good story. And so lore, I think, can help kind of, you know, set you on the right track, especially if you're going to diverge in the storyline somewhere. Uh, lore is kind of like a good litmus test for like, does this feel in keeping with the spirit of this story, even if this didn't happen? Because like, does this break lore? No, like, you know, it, this didn't happen in the story, but it's in keeping with lore. So then like that kind of, it's a good way to have a cohesive kind of feel to a story or to help you in the thought experiment of like, what if we did something different? How would if, if this author had done this storyline, how might that have gone considering what the lore is? So I think it's a good resource and I think it's also a good resource for the reader when you're reading a book to have something like the Silmarillion to refer to if you're like, I'm not totally sure where orcs came from. Like what are these orc things in 
the in these in these Middle Earth stories. Uh, let me go look in the Silmarillion if I personally care about that or would like that expanded upon so I have a fuller understanding of kind of what is meant to be going on here. I think it's good to have that to dip into if you want to. It can help to complete the picture for you, to fill in the blanks a bit for you, to help make sense of what the author was kind of attempting to do with this story now that you have a more complete understanding of the world at large, things like that. I think it's helpful. I think it's a good resource for both the reader and a an adapter. But I don't regard lore and canon as like this immutable truth of the universe, like a law of physics or something that can never be contradicted or broken. And I think there's like a spectrum of how important a piece of lore is. So like, you know, something is breaking lore if like this gem was like, per the author said this gem was blue, but the depiction made it red. That's technically breaking lore. But like, I don't think that's really that important. But if the author had said in the lore that this gem had these powers and these uses and this effect on its user and these are the consequences of using this gem and then the adaptation is like oh what if we completely change you know like what this gem does or how it functions or whatever I think that's like a much more significant breaking of the lore than you know what color was it and so like I think on that spectrum there's like things that kind of like fall within that gradation of like is this like super critical to get right? Is it like central to the theme of the story? Is it a linchpin of the story? Is it like a building block of the of what we're trying to do with this world, you know? Or is it just kind of like, well, he, you know, had to make choices about where things were, what things were, how they looked, what they were called. So like, there's just like information about that. But like, you could change that and not really change anything fundamental about the story. So if you wanted to make it blue instead of red, like, like unless the color of it becomes like extremely like significant in terms of the symbolism, which again, that's possible. I'm not saying color is never important, but you know, it's that kind of like a, which is, which is more of a surface level change that like doesn't really have that much bearing on the fundamental essence of the story and what does. So like, I don't really care if lore is being broken just for the fact of that. I care, is this telling a story that is a good story? Is this telling a story that it's in keeping with the spirit of the original? Um, or alternatively, like, you could tell a story that's not in keeping with the spirit of the original, that that's utterly um, contradicting the spirit of the original. But if that is your intent, if you're trying to do a commentary on the original, then again, like by all means, like if you're you're purposely, you know, giving a new spin on this and consciously deciding, I'm going to do the exact opposite with this piece of lore because I think that that's going to do like. Uh, create the opportunity to do something really interesting with this story. By all means, like, have at. Very interesting things have been done when stories have been, like, altered in that way, to tell them through a new lens, from a different perspective. What if we twist this one piece of lore? What does that do to the rest of the story? Like, yeah, like, I'm all for it. Let's tell good stories. Okay, now that that's out of the way, before we get to the Rings of Power orc problem, uh, let's just talk about THE orc problem. And again, I hope I made it clear, I am not a Tolkien scholar. So this is just a broad strokes, like, kind of a catch-up session um, of, like, the general information that I at least have about the orc problem. So again, I have read the Silmarillion, I have read the trilogy, I have done some googling, I have been on Reddit threads, I have seen some YouTube, like, video essays on like Middle Earth Tolkien Lord of the Rings stuff. That's my scholarship. So when it comes to orcs, um, what I, my understanding of them, like that what stuck with me for most of my life and still to this day does, which is hence the comment that I made in my Rings of Power video, is when I was a kid, my dad told me, because I hadn't read the books, um, my dad told me that orcs were corrupted elves. That was such a horrifying idea to me <laughs> that like because you know I, I saw what the orcs look like in the films and I think that the Peter Jackson films also say this at, at one point but like that's not why it stuck with me like that kind of reaffirmed it I guess if I noticed it it was my dad telling me that that made me like it, it just like created such a deep impression with me that to me when I think of orcs I think of them as corrupted elves and that is supported by the lore again like that commenter doesn't disagree that that happened but it's the is that what all of them still are is each orc that you see was that individual formerly an elf. Tolkien with a lot of things including the orcs kind of went back and forth had kind of differing ideas about kind of how he wanted to do things and so there's like bits and pieces of lore that kind of contradict each other that he kind of played with different ideas about what he wanted to do with this. That's one of the problems with being like lore accurate with Tolkien is that he himself wasn't totally clear on certain things. Um, and so then 
you can find writings of Tolkien's in letters and journals and in pieces that are like they're not officially canonized because they weren't published you know by the Tolkien estate but they exist Tolkien wrote it um where he's like playing with a different idea so it can get messy but I mean in the Silmarillion it does say that they multiply that as this comment says that they they reproduce um so there are the original orcs were corrupted elves but then those corrupted elves then went on to like their produced subsequent generations of orcs that were just born as orcs. That is what the lore supports. But this isn't something that is like heavily um, discussed anywhere. Like that's what it does say. But it's not something that we like talk about a lot in these books. It's not something that we dwell on. It's not something that we depict a lot. It's not something that the Tolkien books or Peter Jackson's films like are interested in exploring. It's like if you wanted to find that piece of information, you can find that piece of information, but it's just like a piece of information. It's not like something we're doing something with in the story, in the main events of the story, or even in the majority of the Silmarillion. The Silmarillion tells you that, but like it doesn't dwell on it. And so again, when it comes to the orc problem, um, one of the other problems with orcs, and one of the reasons why Tolkien kind of had a problem himself with what to do with them, is because orcs themselves, like their function in the story, is not as characters. Like the orcs are representative of an idea. The orcs are like an amalgamation, uh, um, a literalized metaphor. They are the forces of evil. Orcs aren't like persons in a collective they just are the collective they represent an idea which like in real life Tolkien referred to like orcishness so Tolkien referred to like industry destroying nature as orcish behavior it's a concept more than it is like a race in how Tolkien is conceiving of it and so because there is like kind of a, a variety of ideas at play and in how you're gonna make that work in your story and where they came from and what you're doing with that the lore again is a little muddy on this point because that's not Tolkien's focus so it was kind of something that he struggled with pinning down but when it came to the main events of the story like it's not something he wanted to deal with so he had to figure it out for the, the completeness of his world but like that's not what the point of the story is and it's not like an on-page like scene where this is going to come up but he is you know for the for the sake of this world making cohesive sense a determination needed to be made about where this came from what this is but he wasn't interested in doing anything with that when it comes to depicting orcs in an adaptation be it you know a faithful loyal adaptation or a spin on it or whatever it is you can kind of do a lot of different things with orcs because how you end up depicting it, you can probably find something Tolkien wrote somewhere to support what you're going to do with it. Um, you can take it a lot of different ways is what I'm saying. So one, whether your orc depiction is lore accurate is going to be a messy question, kind of no matter what you do in your depiction of orcs. Oh, and the other problem with orcs <laughs> in the orc problem <laughs> is because they are functioning um, as a representation of an idea but what they are are individual people that are in an army or individual persons in an army. If you wanted to do a more allegorical reading of the the Middle Earth stories, which Tolkien doesn't like allegory, it was a big point of contention between him and C.S. Lewis. He does not like allegory and so if uh, we're to take the author's position on this then you should not read Middle Earth stories as an allegory. But if one is to ignore Tolkien and and read into it an allegory, um, having an army of individuals that are uh, an uncritical evil that can be slaughtered without compunction. This depiction of this army um, is problematic because it does reflect real-world ways that other cultures, other races, other nations have been othered at times of war, etc. So this idea that the other, the enemy, you can kill them without guilt because the other, the enemy, they are just evil. They are not individuals with um, complex interior lives. Like the, the enemy is other, the enemy is evil. And so treating the orcs that way in these stories does feel uncomfortable if you're trying to parallel it to the real world where you're fighting in a war and the, the other, the enemy, is othered in this way. Because again, even though I don't think Tolkien would support the idea that you would do that to real world peoples and cultures to other them the way that the orcs are othered, because people have done that, because people have caricatured and villainized the enemy um, in, in the real world, then having that be the, the kind of road that the Middle Earth stories go can feel uncomfortable, can, can make you kind of go, what are we saying with this? What are we doing with this? And again, Tolkien himself, I don't think would support an allegorical reading. 
he would not support the idea of of treating a collective of human beings the way that the collective of orcs is treated in his stories. But it's still it's it's messy. Okay, so my orc problem, but we're gonna get to Rings of Power, I promise. So my orc problem is that I object to essentialism always in all its forms. And essentialism is present in the Middle Earth stories a great deal, not just when it comes to orcs. Stories like Lord of the Rings, they require me to set that aside and to regard what is going on more as a fable. And that is also what I think supported by Tolkien's attitude. I think he intends it to be read that way. And so that goes a long way towards me being okay with it because if I thought that Lord of the Rings was meant to be an allegory, we have a big problem. But because Lord of the Rings is written in the style of and is interpreted by fans more often than not as being mythic and fable-like, where characters are kind of archetypes and avatars for ideas first and characters second, then the fact of a character being all good or a character being all evil, that a group or a race being all good and a group or a race being all evil, because I do not read this and do not believe Tolkien intends me to read this as allegorical, then I read them as avatars for the concept of goodness, avatars for the concept of evil. They are embodiments of these ideas and they function that way in the story. And so when you are killing the all evil thing, I don't read it as the idea that there exist people and races that are all evil and should just be uncritically destroyed, rather that evil should always, we should always seek to destroy the concept of evil, whatever that might mean. But in this story, they are embodied by these characters or by these races or by these objects. And so then because they are the, the embodiment of that thing, then in this story where we have literalized that idea, then it should be destroyed. And so because it's functioning that way in the story, then the essentialist nature of it is less problematic to me and I think to many others. And so the ring in The Lord of the Rings, yes, it is a piece of jewelry, but the ring in Lord of the Rings is more so the embodiment of ideas, the embodiment of temptation, of corruption, of evil. Like that is what the ring, that's the ring's function in the story. I, I mean, I don't think Tolkien would say that jewelry, <laughs> like an actual gold ring, um, is the embodiment of evil. And so orcs are the same. In, in how I understand Tolkien to mean them. That like orcs, okay, they are like persons, just the way that the ring is a, is a piece of jewelry, um, but the orcs aren't really persons. The orcs are a representation of orcishness, this idea of like destruction and corruption and of executing the will of ultimate evil. I don't think he's arguing that there are people in the world or entire races of people in the world that are that. They're just that in the story. But it's a lot trickier to do that with persons than with objects. Having an object of ultimate evil doesn't so much have any real-world problematic connotations, even if you were to read it as an allegory, whereas having an entire race do that in your story, this gets messy and tricky and can be very uncomfy. <laughs> okay, so Rings of Power. Finally at last, having set the scene so entirely. So Rings of Power is not adapting any particular Tolkien story, because legally it can't. <laughs> so instead it's taking bits and bobs and pieces of Tolkien stuff. Not even, I'm not even going to say bits and pieces of what Tolkien wrote necessarily, because it's taking everything Tolkien-esque. Either pieces of writing, pieces of adaptation, pieces of interpretation. It's just taking them all and kind of mushing them together the way a machine learning tool would and spitting out something that to the casual observer strongly resembles Tolkien. And no, I don't think AI wrote Rings of Power, and I think anyone that says so either is not being serious or they don't understand how studios and or machine learning tools work. But so Amazon's executives, I'm guessing I don't know them personally, have certain ideas about what's going to make a show like this a success. So on their mind would be one, Tolkien is popular, full stop. Big groups of fans exist for Tolkien. Two, People seem to really like the Peter Jackson adaptations of Lord of the Rings, and in particular, though not exclusively, in particular, people seem to really like that Peter Jackson really expanded on the, the, the violent battle aspect of these stories, that he in general added kind of more tension and stakes and kind of made uh, made it more action-focused, action-heavy. Uh, think, for example, Frodo getting stabbed by the Morgul blade and then getting to Rivendell. 
in the books. While there is tension, while there is a ticking time bomb element to that part of the story, the way the film does it, it seems a lot more urgent, a lot more dangerous. It's condensed and heightened and everything feels escalated into being this like much more dramatic kind of sequence of events. The books are more uh, slow paced and they, they don't treat it quite that way. So anyway, people seem to like that about Peter Jackson's films. Three, people seem to like expansive worlds with lots of lore and lots of characters. Number four, people do complain that Tolkien has a dearth of female characters. And so we gotta really turn that up to 11 if we wanna please people. And number five, in recent years, despite how much people love stories like the original Tolkien stories, in general taste has shifted towards a messy and gray form of storytelling. People like to see these types of stories um, being subverted and interrogated. So The Witcher or Game of Thrones. And so if we wanna be successful in this day and age, we have to include moral ambiguity. Okay, so at last, the orc family. Does the orc family break lore and canon? No, not really. It is actually entirely in keeping with lore and canon that there would be orc wives and orc children. If you don't believe me, I have examples. Thus did Melkor breed the hideous race of the Orkor in envy and mockery of the Eldar, of whom they were afterwards the bitterest foes. For the Orkor had life and multiplied after the manner of the children of Iluvatar. And not that had life of its own, nor the semblance thereof, could ever Melkor make, since his rebellion in the Ainulindale, before the beginning, so say the wise. And in a letter, when, he, when someone inquired about this, he wrote, There must have been orc women, but in stories that seldom if ever see the orcs except as soldiers of armies in the service of the evil lords, we naturally would not learn much about their lives. Not much was known. Okay, so what's the problem? Why do we hate the orc family? Why does it feel wrong? Well, I can't speak for everyone, but Tolkien, as I already laid out, was not thinking of the orcs as persons, as people. They serve the function of representing a concept. They are the embodiment of evil that is threatening and invading the good. But Tolkien was into super detailed lore and world building, which is great, but not so much when you are trying to describe a race as both a race that is multiplying and existing as people with, you know, spawning children, etc., and as a concept only, and therefore not to be regarded as individuals with personhood. Okay, so why couldn't he just have the evil baddie Melkor simply create a bunch of monsters that the good guys can then kill? Why did he insist several times that orcs multiply? Well, this is the problem when you're sort of writing concept first, story second, because when you have two concepts and concepts are your priority, then these concepts may not work together in a way that serves your story. So let's go back to that quote from before. And not that had life of its own, nor the semblance thereof, could ever Melkor make. You see, it's extremely important to Tolkien's worldview, and therefore the way that his story and the concepts in his story play out, that evil cannot create life. Evil can only corrupt and destroy. Melkor can turn something pure and good, like elves, into something corrupted and evil like orcs. But Melkor cannot create a race of beings out of nothing. That kind of power is reserved for the good guys. And so then we come to Lord of the Rings, where the good guys, they have to be regarded as the good guys, but they also need to triumph over the armies of evil. Well, great, we've got orcs for them to fight. But hang on, where did all of these orcs come from that our heroes have no qualms about slaughtering en masse. Oh, uh, well, let's not dwell on that too much because it might make the heroes seem less heroic. And this is a problem for the original Lord of the Rings. The slaughter of orcs being treated as an uncritical good, it's problematic if you think of the orcs as people, as individuals with complex interior lives and personhood. His sense of duty was no less than yours, I deem. You wonder what his name is, where he came from, if he was really evil at heart. But Tolkien, I don't believe, is suggesting that we should regard any real world people this way. He is not arguing that certain races and certain cultures can be slaughtered en masse without compunction. Orcs aren't people in this sense. Orcs are the embodiment of evil. They are an avatar, they are a symbol. And being just this literalized metaphor, they can be killed without guilt, without sin, without tainting the goodness of our heroes. And you can get away with this in a story that continues to depict them in this way. If in your depiction you are just showing them 
as this unthinking mass of aggressors that is is swarming like an infestation of bugs that it's just carrying out the will of the big bad but there is no sort of individual agency being represented again as tolkien himself wrote in stories that seldom if ever see the orcs except as soldiers of armies in the service of the evil lords we naturally would not learn much about their lives. And so when we watch Peter Jackson's films, while we might sometimes sort of go, hang on, are we good with just slaughtering all of these dudes? Like, it seems a little bit bloodthirsty, I don't know. But generally we understand that they are just kind of an indistinguishable swarm um, that represents the power of the evil baddie that we are killing. Again, much more can be said and has been said by many people about how uncomfortably this maps onto real world conflicts, about how real world peoples have been othered, have been have been described as this kind of inhuman um, evil. But again, uh, Tolkien was not a big fan of allegory. And so regardless of what others might read into it or might take out of it, um, Tolkien himself, I do not believe was making a case for this kind of treatment of real world people. Okay, so back to the rings of power. Here they've decided that because moral ambiguity is all the rage, then we should show orcs as being people too. And if the writers had truly had a vision for that, if they truly wanted to go like fully commit to this angle, if they wanted to kind of recontextualize the events of the Middle Earth stories by showing them entirely through the eyes of Sauron and the orcs, that could be brilliant. Personally, I think that would be extremely tricky to do. Like you'd have to really have a vision for that because you'd have to basically entirely rewrite everything in these books and in these stories and in this world, which I'm not, that's not impossible, but that's a tall order. And again, that, so that could be brilliant. It would be, I think, super interesting and thought provoking to see like basically a Wide Sargasso Sea of Tolkien. If you're not familiar with the Wide Sargasso Sea, the Wide Sargasso Sea is a prequel to Jane Eyre, Jane Eyre written by Charlotte Bronte. And in Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, spoilers for Jane Eyre, the male love interest in this gothic, you know, story, um, there's something spooky going on in his house and you find out that it's actually his first wife, that she's insane and she's in the attic and he's stuck with her because he can't divorce her back in the day. So he can't marry Jane Eyre because he's already got a wife and she's crazy and she's violent and she's, you know, not evil, but you know, she's the mad violent wife that he's like stuck with that's in the attic. And so like, oh, that's such a tragedy for him to be stuck with her. It's such a tragedy for Jane Eyre to not be able to marry him because he's already got this wife that he can't get rid of. Um, like that's, that's what's going on in Jane Eyre. So White Sargasso Sea is a prequel about how he first meets the, what is his wife and how he's actually the one to drive her insane that she's not, you know, the mad wife. She's, you know, a normal person that marries this man and this man is so cruel that he gaslights her into being insane. And then that that entirely recontextualizes the events of Jane Eyre when you're like, oh, what if it's like she wasn't just the mad wife, you know? And it it complicates it and it's it's a new lens through which to view that story. And it's very interesting. It doesn't mean that Jane Eyre is invalid now. It doesn't ruin Jane Eyre, but it is a very interesting new perspective to bring to Jane Eyre and be like, what if we told this from the perspective of the mad wife? What if we did that? What would that tell us about this story? So again, if you, Jane Eyre is a very um, small in scope story. There's very few characters. You really, you know, the main ones here are Mr. Rochester, Jane Eyre, mad wife, a few other like side characters. <laughs> Um, apologies to fans of Jane Eyre. I know there's more characters than that. But so like that's a much um, smaller project to recontextualize that entire story through this other lens. If you wanted to do that with the whole of Middle Earth, with the whole history of Middle Earth, you could do that. I'm not saying you can't, but that's a much bigger project that would require a lot of anyone doing that. But Rings of Power is not interested in doing that. Not actually at all. <laughs> they are not interested in deconstructing Tolkien. On the contrary, Rings of Power wants to cash in on how popular Tolkien is, as is. They want to cash in on how much people love the way Tolkien wrote everything and cash in also on the way Peter Jackson depicted a lot of it. And we are still meant to root for the pure and perfect and beautiful elves that are slaughtering the evil, nasty, corrupted orcs. Now Game of Thrones works because we don't uncritically support any one side over another. We have favorites, we think some are slightly better and worse than others. We don't have like an uncritical side of good, pure beauty and an evil side of ugliness and 
evilness and that that we're slaughtering and not questioning it. We're saying that both sides are messy. Both sides are selfish and greedy and doing evil things. We're saying there isn't really a side that you can root for, except in the case of the White Walkers. And you know what Game of Thrones doesn't do? It doesn't show White Walkers as having Mrs. White Walker and White Walker Jr. We do not show the White Walkers as thinking, feeling individuals with personal lives. They are zombies. Okay, so in Rings of Power, our pure, good, beautiful elves are still slaughtering the evil, but now uncomfortably sympathetic orcs? Yay? Well, let's not forget girl power. So we gotta throw in Galadriel declaring she's going to genocide the entire race of orcs in season one. Tolkien would be horrified. And I'm not talking about him being horrified that, that Galadriel is a girl boss or that the story makes no sense. I mean, forget that. Just when she's declaring genocide on orc kind. Tolkien's good guys, they would never, ever speak this way or, or express these, these kinds of desires, unless they were exhibiting the influence, the corrupting influence of the ring or some, something like that. So if Galadriel's zeal for, for helping Middle-earth was turned into this genocidal bloodlust because she was wearing the one ring and it was having this negative effect on her, setting aside how we'd even get into that situation where that is happening. Yeah, Tolkien might co-sign that if like this is showing what the ring does to you. But that's not what the show did. The show just had Galadriel speaking this way about about orcs which are being portrayed more sympathetically in this show than they are in Peter Jackson's films. Um, and so we at last come to Glug, Mrs. Glug, and Glug Jr. Why are they here? What is Rings of Power trying to say? What are we trying to do with this inclusion? Is it technically lore accurate? I mean, yeah, put simply, their existence does not contradict lore. But why are they here? Much like Tolkien was struggling with having his cake and eating it too, insofar as he needed the orcs to be evil, but also evil cannot create life, and so then they need to be like naturally born and multiplying because we can't have evil creating life. But our heroes also have to be able to slaughter them en masse without that being bad, and so it gets messy. Rings of Power likewise is trying to have its cake and eat it too. Orcs need to be evil because our good guys need to continue to slaughter them, just like they do in Peter Jackson's films, but we need to have moral ambiguity so that we can be like Game of Thrones. And so the orcs also have to be sort of sympathetic, but it's still totally fine that our heroes are slaughtering them without any second thoughts. And so this is the problem with orcs. Peter Jackson went with Tolkien's approach more or less. Do the orcs have families and personhood? Well, this story isn't about that, so we're just not really gonna get into it. Rings of Power could have done a wide Sargasso Sea and do a whole show that's actually about how the elves are the totalitarian, puritanical evil baddies who are trying to genocide a race that they regard as kind of icky and ugly and tell the whole thing from the perspective of Sauron and the orcs. But in that version, we cannot be rooting for Galadriel. And if there's one person that Rings of Power definitely wants you to root for, it's Galadriel. The orcs are tricky. There's no two ways about that. The best of adaptations is gonna kind of struggle with orcs because Tolkien himself kind of struggled with orcs. But I think more than anything what this demonstrates is the necessity of being clear about your intentions with the story that you're telling. There is no best intention to have. There is no good or bad way to tell a story to approach an adaptation. But the one thing that it has to be is intentional. You have to know what you are trying to do, what you are trying to say, what impression you are trying to leave people with. Tolkien knew he had a problem with orcs, but he also knew what kind of a story he was trying to tell. And so no good can come from suddenly including a scene where we go to the orc village, because the story that Tolkien is telling, it doesn't need that, and it doesn't add anything. In fact, it only makes things messy and weird and bad, and this is not what we are trying to do with this story. Now, Rings of Power has a problem with this all over the place, where they're constantly putting things in that make you go, why is this here? What are we doing with this? What is the point of this? But the orc family, I think, gets at more at the heart of the theme of, the, of these stories. And that's, I think, part of why this really rubs people the wrong way. Like, other things in this show are kind of like, well, that was a waste of time. Well, that didn't go anywhere. Well, I don't know why we're showing this. This is pointless. This, nothing's happening. This was a plot cul-de-sac. Why was this necessary? And that just kind of makes you go, uh, this is not great. The orc thing, orcs in the Middle-earth stories, they are 
the the representation of evil that our heroes are trying to defeat. Now, I'm not saying that you cannot complicate that. As I already said, if you wanted to do a whole rewrite of this from the perspective of the orcs, uh, that could be very interesting, depending on who was doing it, what they were trying to do with that. If that's not what you're trying to do, then if you're you're going to throw in this this complication where we're going to show the orcs as maybe kind of a little bit sympathetic, why? And if you can't answer the question why, then you shouldn't do it because this has ramifications. Because changing this part of the story, it doesn't just change orcs. You can't think of any piece of your story as existing within a vacuum. It's not just orcs are depicted as bad, what if we depicted them as kind of sympathetic, and that in a vacuum exists by itself, this is what we did with orcs. Because how other characters interact with this piece of your story says something about those characters. A character that slaughters a zombie, an unthinking evil, is different from a character that slaughters a person who has feelings in a family. Because the person who's being slaughtered has changed, it changes the person doing the slaughtering. So if the writers of the show looked at their elf characters in isolation in a vacuum and said, well, the elves are killing the orcs, that's fine. And then in isolation, they looked at the orcs and were like, well, the orcs, we're gonna make them kind of sympathetic. And that's fine. But these two things, when they interact, are now altered because an elf that's killing an orc that's just an avatar of evil is different from an elf that's killing an orc that is just kind of a, an ugly looking person that chose the wrong side. These are not the same thing. Let me know your thoughts if I missed anything, if my representation of Tolkien's positions or his lore was way off, you know. Sure, correct me. Like I said, I'm not an expert. I feel comfortable saying I know more than the average person, but there are people that know far more than I do about Tolkien lore, Middle Earth, the man himself, etc. Let me know your thoughts and I'll see you in my next video. I knew Lindale. 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 And not that had life of its own, nor the semblance thereof, could ever Melkor make since his rebellion in the Ein.